Hello, everybody. A warm welcome to Wisdom from North, the Nordic platform for accelerated inner growth and empowerment. I'm Janneke, and today I'm very excited to be here with Robert Swartz again. Robert is a certified a hypnotist where he specializes in between life soul regression, where it helps people heal, uh, resolve life issues, and understand their life plan. Robert is the author of Your Soul's Plan, Your Soul's Gift, and he recently came out with another book called Your Soul's Love, where he explores uh, challenges posed by romantic relationships. And that's what we're going to speak about today. Hello, Robert. A warm welcome back. How are you doing? I'm well. Uh, it's good to be back with you. You and I have talked a couple of times before, and it's always a pleasure. Yes, I remember our interview was very well received. People loved these, these topics. I think it really heals people to understand that there's a meaning with their suffering, that there is actually a plan there that they have designed, designed before they came down here. Uh, and today we're going to speak about your third book, which is more focused on romantic relationships. Uh, and I'm going to link to our previous interview here, but uh, nevertheless, for those who are completely new to you, I would love for you to share like the backstory of actually how you got into this work, because I know that in your forties you were somewhere else in the corporate mm -hmm. world, not feeling happy and fulfilled. Uh, so tell us about the spiritual experience you had and how you're doing what you're doing today. Yeah, uh, a number of years ago when, when I was 40, which is a long time ago, uh, I was very unfulfilled doing uh, basically corporate writing, corporate marketing, communications. And several things happened uh, within a very short time of each other that took me in a completely different direction. Uh, the first thing that happened is that uh, for the first time in my life, I went to see a medium. The reason I went was just that I was so unhappy doing this corporate work and I wanted to try to figure out what else can I do with my life. Well, right away at the beginning of the session, she said to me, your spirit guides are here. And I said, what is a spirit guide? I had never even heard the term before. She said, well, a guide is a highly evolved being who helps us plan our lives uh, before we come into body. And then she said, your guides would like to speak directly with you. And she started to channel them. The first thing they said was, you planned your life, including your biggest challenges before you were born. And I shook my head and I said, why in the world would I have done that? And they said, you did this for purposes of spiritual growth. Now, what was really impressive about this was that they then launched into this long dialogue about what my challenges had been and why I had wanted to experience them. And they knew what all of my challenges had been without me telling them a single thing about myself. So this gave them total credibility. Uh, and it really just blew my mind wide open, so to speak. I'd never heard of this idea of pre-birth planning before, but intuitively it resonated as truth to me. Then within a very short time of that experience, I was doing nothing more than walking down the street when I had a spiritually transformative experience of divine unconditional love for all people, every person I saw. Uh, and this is not a human kind of love. It was a transcendent love. Everywhere I looked, every time I saw another person, this feeling of overwhelming, pure, unconditional love washed over me. And I understood intuitively that I was in some kind of enhanced communion with my own soul. In other words, my soul was saying to me, this love is who you really are. It's your true nature. And I later figured out that my soul gifted me with that experience because when I researched people's pre-birth plans for the three books, every pre-birth plan was based on unconditional love. So that experience of myself, my soul is unconditional love, showed me experientially that we as souls are made literally from the energy of un unconditional love and that's how I know what I was finding in my research was correct. And then uh, within a very short time of that experience, I met a woman who can channel her soul and her soul told me in great detail how pre-birth planning works. Uh, we did about 15 hours of channeling together. And in that 15 hours, I learned all kinds of amazing things about pre-birth planning. And it really served as the foundation for the three books I went on to write. 
So the combination of those three things got me to say, okay, I'll leave the corporate world and I'll write books about pre-birth planning. And now a number of years later, I have a completely different and much more fulfilling life. Fascinating. And I, I feel like that spiritual experience you had really verified what you had uh, experienced uh, with that medium or that woman who was channeling this information. Uh, uh, it seems like, uh, because that's not natural that it happens to people that you just get this experience. So it seemed very aligned in a way. Uh, and now you have a huge success also with your books. Uh, it's amazing. Um, I would love to hear a bit about the different plans that we have. Um, you write in this book, Your Soul's Love, that we have a plan A, which is the highest vibrational path or, yeah, or life. And then we also have plan B, plan C, plan D, plan, yes, infinite perhaps, I don't know. So tell us a little bit about these different life plans and what it also means by your highest vibrational path as plan A? So one of the mediums uh, with whom I collaborate to research people's pre-birth plans, she reports that when uh, she first connects with spirit, spirit shows her in regard to whoever we're talking about, an incredibly vast and elaborate flow chart. Well, what is a flow chart? It's a series of decision points. If you do A, then X happens. If you do B, then Y happens. The flow chart that spirit shows her is so vast and elaborate and intricate, it's really beyond human comprehension. That flow chart is her soul taking into account the free will decisions she might make. So yes, there's a plan A, and that is the most loving plan. Almost nobody is executing plan A. Jesus, Buddha, and so forth would do that. Uh, the rest of us default to some of these backup plans. Uh, and then you go to plan B, plan C, plan D, slightly lower in vibration. Basically, the more you make loving decisions, the higher the vibrational path that's activated. And a lot of times when you do that, the challenges that were planned as potentials before you were born are no longer needed because you've used your free will to learn the underlying lesson. If you do that, then the challenge simply never happens. So all of this is accounted for in this very vast and elaborate flow chart that spirit shows to us when we research people's pre-birth plans. That's amazing. Can, can you talk a bit about free will uh, and destiny and how they really go together? Yeah, I, I like to, <clears throat> excuse me. I like to answer that question with a hypothetical story. So let's say that there is a soul we will call Sally. And Sally has had a number of past lives in which she made certain plans, but then when she got here, when she got into body, she had a tendency to defer to the wishes of others, which is a very common thing to do. She let other people tell her how to live her life. When she has her life review at the end of those incarnations, she sees that she has this tendency and she decides, okay, I'm going to take that back into body energetically, not for the purpose of expressing it, but rather for the purpose of healing it. So that's her plan. Now let's say that there's another soul in her soul group, we'll call him George. George has had a number of past lives in which he displayed the opposite tendency. He dominated others, he used power inappropriately. He has a life review just like Sally did. He sees that he has this tendency and like Sally, he decides, all right, I'm going to bring that back into body energetically in order to heal it. Now, because they're in the same soul group, Sally knows about George's pre-birth plan. So she goes to him before they incarnate and she says something like, hey, George, I'm taking back into body the tendency to defer to the wishes of others for the purpose of healing it. I see that you're taking back into body the opposite tendency, the tendency to dominate others also in order to heal it. Why don't we make a plan that you and I will marry, say at the age of 30, and although we know that this is likely to be a turbulent relationship, our hope is that I will learn to stand up for myself and you will learn to respect the wishes of others. So that's their plan. Now let's say when Sally is 25 years old, she gets a job with an employer who's treating her with a lack of respect and kindness. And let's say that she marshals her internal resources and she takes a stand. She says to her employer, stop. You may not treat me that way, 
If you want me to keep working here, you must treat me with respect and kindness. In the moment she takes a stand like that, there's a huge increase in her vibration. If she can sustain the heightened vibration until she's 30, now one of two things will happen. Either she and George never meet because her vibration is up here, his is down here, they go right by each other. Or if they do meet, there's no attraction, again, because their vibrations are so dissimilar. They have one date and then they never see each other again. So in this hypothetical story, Sally has used her free will to learn the plan lesson, which was to stand up for herself. And that in turn obviates the need for the plan challenge, the turbulent marriage. Now, somebody might say, well, what about George? Doesn't he still have to learn his lesson? Yes, he does. And he will draw to himself other circumstances and relationships that will give him the opportunity to respect the wishes of others. That shows you this intersection between free will and pre-birth planning. Fascinating. And, and then we also have, we, we don't only have past lives or, or perhaps we only have uh, simultaneous lives. Can you share a little bit about that? Because there is really no time. Yeah, on the other side, in the non-physical realm, uh, as you said, there is no linear time. Everything happens in the eternal now moment. This is a concept that it is very hard for the human brain to understand because the brain is designed to perceive and process linear time. But from your soul's perspective, all the lifetimes are happening concurrently in the now moment. So if you think, for example, of a CD that has seven songs on it, you, because of the limitations of the five senses, can only listen to one song at a time. Now, if every song represents a lifetime, then from your soul's perspective, the soul is able to listen to all seven songs simultaneously. Again, it's hard for the human brain to understand that, but that's the soul's perspective. And then is it so that I, in my life right now, in this incarnation, uh, can be influenced by certain simultaneous lives and not others because I'm supposed to learn something from, for instance, 10 of my simultaneous lives and not the thousand others. That's so, sort of the soul picks what, what influences this incarnation from other incarnations. Yeah, that, that topic came up a couple of times in my second book, Your Soul's Gift. Uh, there's a chapter in that book about the pre-birth planning of mental illness. Uh, and the story there is about a woman who, when she's asleep at night, starting in early childhood, uh, if she had a nightmare, when she woke up, the nightmare would appear to continue in her physical reality. So it was a, a terrifying experience for her. And it went on for decades into midlife. We did a channeling session with Jesus, and I asked him what is going on here. And he said she is processing unhealed energies on behalf of parallel selves in parallel dimensions. So they needed healing, and she was the vehicle through which the healing was taking place. There's another chapter in Your Soul's Gift where this comes up, a chapter about a woman who experiences a rape. Her name is Beverly. And again, we spoke with Jesus about what was happening. And he tells us that there are parallel Bever Beverly's in parallel dimensions. And I said, well, how many Beverly's are there? And he says about three or four, which is a very interesting way of phrasing it. And I said something like, well, how can it be about three or four? Doesn't it have to be a discrete number? And then he goes into an analogy. He says, think of a tree with many branches. The trunk of the tree is the soul. The branches are the individual personalities that incarnate in the different lifetimes. So branches grow, but then they die and they fall off the tree. Then more branches grow, die, fall off the tree. But the trunk of the tree is still there. He said that is more or less what is happening with the soul and the different personalities that are incarnated in the different lifetimes. But then I asked him, well, does this mean that there are Beverly's in parallel dimensions who did not experience the rape? And he says, yes. So basically what is happening, the soul is playing out all of the major possibilities to learn as much as possible about whatever it is that the personalities are experiencing. 
Wow, fascinating. I, I get so amazed by the universe. Uh, we're going to soon go into your third book. Uh, but before that, uh, how would you describe what a soul is and what soul groups are? I think of the soul as what you could call a spark of God. And I think the personality is what you could call a spark of the soul. A soul group, as I understand it, is a collection of souls who are at more or less the same stage of evolution, which is another way of saying more or less the same vibration. So you and the other members of your soul group, you will take turns incarnating into all kinds of different roles for each other. And from the soul's perspective, the roles are not judged in any way. The soul doesn't say, this is good, this is bad. They're all just viewed as opportunities for learning. So you and the other members of your soul group will take turns being every kind of relationship you can think of, father and daughter, mother and son, husband and wife, best of friends, mortal enemies, teacher and student, employer and employee, even murderer and the one who is murdered. And again, there's no judgment at the soul level about any of those roles. They're just seen as roles that characters are playing on a stage temporarily during a physical lifetime. And then when the physical body dies, it's like you stop playing the role, you cross back over, and then you return to being what you could call your true self. I just had to sneeze. Bless you. <laughs> I have so much allergies. <laughs> How many souls uh, are there in a soul group? That might be difficult to speak uh, about I, or say something about because maybe a soul can split into two or different, I don't know, more energies. Uh, but do you have some thoughts about that? Well, I, that is not something I've researched myself, but there are some uh, channelings about it. And the number seems to be somewhere between 25 and 75. Um, that's as much as I really know about that. Okay. Tell us about the motivation for your third book, which focuses more on love and romantic relationships. Well, this is something that people had kept asking me to write about. I mean, everyone is interested in romantic relationships, whether you're in one or not. Uh, people want to know what are they all about? Why do they have them? Why are they so important to us? And so I, basically I asked Spirit, what topics under romantic relationships would you like me to write about? And certain ideas came to me. Uh, so there are chapters about the pre-birth planning of infidelity, uh, being single for almost all of a lifetime, uh, celibate relationships, impotence. And then there's a, a particularly, to me, interesting chapter about something I call interdimensional parenting, which is a phenomenon I just stumbled into as I was writing the book. Uh, this is a phenomenon in which um, when two people have a child or children, and then one of the partners dies, the partner who has crossed back over to the non-physical helps the partner who stayed in body to raise the children. So they remain just as active in their lives as if they were here in body, but it's done from the non-physical realm. Fascinating. Um, can you share a little bit about, uh, for instance, how we choose our partner, how, how that is done in a way? Uh, I, you, you mentioned that a little bit. Uh, and we, we have these phrases of uh, soulmates and twin souls. And okay, let's go there first, actually. Twin souls and soulmates. Is actually soulmate just then a soul from your soul group? Uh, or is it a special soul from the soul group uh, that you incarnate together that means more than the others? And, uh, and then we can take twin souls as well, if you have some thoughts about that, or twin flames even. My understanding of a soulmate is that it's another soul that uh, you have a long, very long standing relationship with. You've probably incarnated together in many, many different lifetimes. You've played many different roles for each other. There's a tremendous amount of love that has been generated between soulmates. Uh, basically, it's another soul that you know very, very well and you trust completely. You trust them so much that you feel free to script all kinds of different roles for each other, and you trust that they will play the role uh, to the very best of their ability, not taking it too far, but also taking it far enough so that you can learn what you wanted to learn. Twin flames or, or twin souls 
And that is not something I've really looked at in my work. Uh, there's a lot of general literature about this and it suggests that uh, a soul splits into two and then the two twin parts uh, eventually come back together through one means or another, but it isn't something that I've really looked at in my work. Um, who is channeling this book? Is it, uh, is it some of the mediums that you work with or is it yourself? Well, this book is different than the first two in that uh, it contains channelings from the same mediums and channels who are in the first two books, but unlike the first two books, a lot of the research is based on what I do as a hypnotist. So I specialize in something called a between lives soul regression, also known as an LBL or life between lives regression. And in that kind of session, which is very long, usually two to three hours, the client talks to a group of very wise, loving and highly evolved beings called the Council of Elders. The council members know everything about that person's pre-birth plan and also everything about every past life they've ever lived. So when you get in front of the council of elders, and that is potentially a life-changing experience because if it's for your highest good, they can answer literally any question you put to them. And a lot of people will come out of a between life soul regression and they'll say things like, they answered every question I asked, I have no more questions about my life. So really a transformative experience. Uh, but coming back to your question, so the research in the book is a combination of sessions with mediums and channels who can access a person's pre-birth plan and our conversations with the Council of Elders where we ask directly about the person's pre-birth plan. Do you have any thoughts about, you know, when you're investigating this with your clients, they get so much information, right, about their life plans, but we don't do that in our everyday lives. Like, why don't we know more about our plan? And then it is accessible if we just, you know, go out to really understand it and go to somebody like you. Well, I, I think there are several very good reasons why we choose to forget the plan when we first come into body. Uh, one is that it's kind of like the difference between an open book test and a closed book test in school. You know, if, if it's going to be an open book test, you think, all right, I'll just look up the answers during the test. And so you don't study so hard and you don't learn so much. Well, when you forget the pre-birth plan, that effectively turns life into a closed book test. So you end up learning more. Uh, also, by forgetting the pre-birth plan, it makes everything that happens here seem very real, very serious and very intense, even though none of those things are actually true. But because everything seems so serious and so intense, the experiences we have here in this state of amnesia uh, generate very intense emotions. And a lot of the growth and learning in the Earth School comes through the process of feeling very intense emotions, learning to relate to them skillfully, and learning to express them skillfully. And then there's a third reason, I think, for forgetting the pre-birth plan, and that is uh, when you don't remember your pre-birth plan, you naturally have a lot of questions about what your life is all about. Well, the process of having lots of questions, deciding which ones are important enough to pursue, because you'll never have time to pursue all of them, and then actually pursuing some of them and getting some of the answers, that whole process is a process of deep learning. If you remembered everything about your plan, you would have no questions, and then you would be deprived of that entire process. So I think those are the reasons for forgetting the plan. How detailed is a life plan? I'm just thinking that uh, in this book, uh, you wrote about, about for instance, uh, a lady, Kathy, being single, uh, choosing that to learn about that, and that's a big topic. However, I bet she has so many other experiences in her life and, uh, and other topics. So do you have any uh, understanding of how detailed the, these plans are? I think there are, there are two things that are happening concurrently in everybody's life. One is that before you come into body, you lay down what you could call certain karmic tracks. So these are broad themes that you've chosen to explore in a lifetime. For example, you decide you want to deepen in compassion or empathy or patience or unconditional love. So those are the broad karmic tracks that you're laying down. 
and they dictate in general terms the kinds of experiences you're going to have. But then happening concurrently with that, there are very specific plans that are made when you need something very specific to happen. So for example, uh, Michael Newton, the hypnotist who founded the Life Between Lives uh, regression method back in the 1990s, when he regressed some of his patients uh, to the pre-birth state, he found that they were doing things like, for example, uh, if it was important for uh, a particular man and a particular woman to meet because they wanted to marry, they would practice in the pre-birth planning how they were going to recognize each other. And some of that is very detailed and specific, like a woman is wearing a certain dress with a polka dot pattern on it, or she has an umbrella that's a bright red color, some kind of signal they practice recognizing so that when they meet in body, they'll recognize each other. Wow, how fascinating. Wow. Um, let's go into some of the chapters. Uh, one of the chapters was about infidelity. Uh, and a woman experiencing that, that her husband was uh, unfaithful. Why do you think uh, a soul wants to experience infidelity? Well, a lot of what I found in my research into people's pre-birth plans is that uh, very often when we're planning big challenges like infidelity, a lot of the motivation at the soul level is to cultivate and express certain qualities that are very important to the soul. And I gave these qualities the name divine virtues. And over a period of years, I put together a list of the ones that came up the most often. I think there are now 28 or so on the list. It's things like unconditional love, patience, empathy, acceptance, uh, self-referencing, which means you come to see yourself as the highest and best source of wisdom and knowledge for you, and a number of other things. So if you want to learn certain virtues, deepen in them and express them, uh, something like infidelity gives you an opportunity to do that. Which virtues could come out of the experience of infidelity? Well, forgiveness, first and foremost, uh, but also acceptance, empathy, compassion. Those would be the main ones that come to mind right away for me. Uh, but again, the, the idea here is not that we want to suffer. The, the suffering is something that is viewed as being acceptable in order to learn the underlying lessons. But the, the intention is not to create meaningless suffering, it's to cultivate the divine virtues. Would, uh, I think, it, was it Bob that was unfaithful to, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, Trisha and Bob, Bob, I think it was, mm -hmm. two right. characters, yes. So. Would Bob then uh, get more karma that has to be balanced again when he's unfaithful to her and then they need to do it all over again? Maybe she does something to him to balance the karma out. You know, I asked that very question uh, in the incest chapter in Your Soul's Gift. There's a whole chapter about the pre-birth planning of incest. And I asked, again, we're talking to Jesus and I asked him, uh, if somebody plans to experience incest, does the perpetrator accrue karma? Because it's an agreement, why would they then accrue karma? And he says they do. They do receive karma for doing that, even though it's agreed upon by both parties. Now, why the soul accrues karma is a question that I have not yet answered. Uh, you know, every answer I get when I do these channeling sessions generates more questions. And at some point, we just have to stop asking questions so that I can finish writing the book. So I have not actually gotten the opportunity yet to ask him why the soul would approve karma in that case. But that question is at the top of the list for the next book. Wow. Um, my grandparents are uh, dead. Uh, they're on the other side. And I wonder, like generally, when do souls incarnate again? Like how long does it take before they decide to incarnate again? Because I've heard somewhere that uh, they often wait for us, but uh, maybe they'll wait for my grandchildren and then their grandchildren. So I'm, I'm, or they might appear as my grandchildren or my, my children if I get children one day. I'm curious about that, like how long they, they stay there. I, I guess it's individually, but maybe there's some, something general as well. 
I think there is a lot of individual variability, but what I've uh, heard and read is that it averages somewhere around 75 years in linear time. But again, when you're on the other side planning a life, you're not in linear time anymore. Right. So on the other side, when you, you do your pre-planning, uh, it is with the Council of Elders, I understood? Well, the planning is actually done more in conjunction with God or source or whatever term you want to use, your higher self and your spirit guides. The council is, as I understand it, overseeing this whole process of reincarnation. So they're, they're looking at it from, uh, you know, 10,000 feet. The planning is done in what you could say is 1,000 feet. Ah, can a path go wrong? Can, can there be any mistakes? Like, are there accidents in the universe, do you think? It, it depends on your definition of mistake. If, if by mistake or accident, you mean do things happen that are not foreseen in the pre-birth planning session, uh, that does happen. Most things are foreseen, even things that are a very low probability. But sometimes things do happen that are not foreseen. Uh, whether or not it's a mistake depends upon your point of view. From the human perspective, uh, we would say, yes, there are a lot of mistakes. From a higher level perspective, we would say there are no mistakes because uh, what we call mistakes are just opportunities for further learning. So the mistake may put you on a life path that is more arduous, longer, more difficult, but eventually you're going to get where you plan to go one way or another. I don't know if you've been to a psychic, but I'm curious about uh, people who are clairvoyant and can see part of the future. And from what I have understood, they cannot be 100% correct because there's always a filter there, their own ego. And at the same time, we have multiple futures. What I like have arrived at is that maybe they are seeing a possible future from what trajectory you or what track you are on, so to say. So if I'm on plan C, all of a sudden they see that future, but I might change to plan D or plan B. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, it's exactly what you just said. That's my understanding as well. So when you go to see somebody who's making predictions about the future, they're making their prediction at the point you are at in linear time when you're talking to them. But as soon as the conversation ends, the energetic probabilities start to shift based upon your free will decisions. And the farther away you get from that conversation with the psychic, the more the energetic potentials have shifted. And this is why of all the questions you can ask a medium or a channel in these kinds of sessions, the questions about when something will happen are the ones that generate the most inaccurate responses because of your use of free will. Fascinating. Um, the Hall of Records, you talk about that in the book. What is that? Uh, that's another term for the Akashic Record. The Akashic Record is the complete non-physical record of every word, thought, and action relevant to the Earth plane, including the pre-birth planning. So in, in my second and third books, Your Soul's Gift and Your Soul's Love, one of the channels I work with, uh, Barbara Brodsky, she channels an ascended master named Aaron. And the Akashic Record is the means by which Aaron finds out what somebody planned before they were born. So with that person's permission, he'll go into that person's Akashic Record and he can find out anything they want to know about their life plan. Uh, do you know... Uh... Uh, if you want to answer this uh, a bit about your soul's plan, if you are on A, B, C, or uh, or uh, maybe uh, wants to get on another plan that is even higher, or I'm just curious. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know whether I'm on A, B, or C, but I, I know in general what it is that I'm doing here. Uh, my understanding is I had two past lives that are particularly relevant to this lifetime, uh, and they're very similar in nature. One was in Atlantis. And apparently I was an Atlantean citizen who was opposed to the atrocities the government was perpetrating, but I didn't have the courage to speak out against those atrocities. And then the same thing happened in Nazi Germany. I was a German citizen who was opposed to what the Nazis were doing, but again, I lacked the courage to speak out against it. So the karma for this lifetime is that I will courageously speak my truth 
even though that truth might be something that is not accepted by mainstream society. And that's basically the nature of the work that I'm doing. This whole concept of free birth planning is not yet in the mainstream, but that's part of the reason why I got this mission because it balances the karma from those two past lives. Um, I'm wondering, uh, do you feel more openness around these topics uh, now since you started writing? I think there's been a huge shift and the shift is happening uh, exponentially, not linearly. So just really in the last couple of years, there's been an enormous change compared to the 10 years previous to that. I think what we're seeing around the world are, is a mass awakening and it's happening in one big wave after another, after another. Uh, everything has shifted tremendously in the last couple of years. I've always wondered about spirit, uh, why everything is so hidden. Uh, and uh, for us who works with this and really believe that there's life after death and everything, uh, it would be so lovely to have some real evidence <laughs> to show. Um, I don't know if this is something you've asked, if there would be possible to have some more evidence or if we just have to go within, like that is the whole clue of it all that we cannot like show this is like this, like this is science or make it scientific. We actually have to all of us experience it on the inside. And uh, I think both of those things are true. It's important and will always be important to go within. But I think technologies are being developed now that will allow us to communicate with non-physical loved ones on the other side. Uh, there's a technology now being developed called the soul phone. There will be a kind of phone to the other side. Really? It's in, yeah, soul it's in, phone. <laughs> soul phone. Uh, it's in its infancy, but it's showing a lot of promise from what I understand. And there are other technologies that I'm not really familiar with that are along the same lines. Uh, one way or another, it allows you to communicate with non-physical beings. I think that kind of thing is really going to accelerate in the coming years. Fascinating. And then we're going to wrap up soon, but I'd love to hear a bit about Kathy who was single. Why would a, a person want to be single? I've been single a lot in my life, so I just jumped right into that chapter. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you can share a little bit about Kathy's journey and, and why she chose that. And, and again, if she can choose to find a partner, like what she has to overcome to do that. Yeah, Kathy is somebody who uh, she's had relate moment relationships, but by and large has been single for the vast majority of her 60 plus years on Earth. And this was by free birth design. Uh, coming back to the divine virtues, one of the virtues is self-love. And that was the primary karmic track that she was laying down in this lifetime. She wanted to deepen in self-love. So very often when we want to do something like that, we create what I refer to as a learning through opposites life plan. You plan to experience the exact opposite of what it is you want to eventually learn because from a soul perspective, the experience of the opposite is viewed as providing you with both the opportunity and the motivation to cultivate the virtue you want to cultivate. So in Kathy's case, by spending so many years uh, single, uh, the pain that she experienced, the loneliness was intended to drive her within where hopefully she would cultivate self-love. And in fact, she did. She's cultivated quite a bit of self-love. And I think when she has her life review, the lifetime will be viewed as very successful. Ah, oh, wonderful. And if she did cultivate a lot of self-love, could she then um, increase her vibration so much that she could meet somebody? That, that could happen. Uh, it has not happened yet, but she's just in her 60s. There's plenty of time, presumably. Uh, and yes, you can use your free will, again, to learn the underlying lessons. And if you use your free will to learn the planned lessons, then you don't need the challenge anymore. So in her case, the need to be single would fall by the wayside and her vibration would be high enough that she could then attract a romantic partner. Can you share a little bit about why people feel, a lot of people feel, I'm attracting the same person again and again. Like this person that hurts me, I'm always abandoned. 
I always fall for unavailable people or whatever the pattern is. Uh, if you could share a little bit about that and how we can sort of get out of that, if you have some experience with that. Yeah, so, you know, life in the third dimension is set up to be a mirror. The third dimension mirrors you back to you so that you can find out what lies within your consciousness, even if it's at the subconscious level. And then if there's something there that's in need of healing, you can become consciously aware of it and go about healing it. So for somebody who feels that they're constantly being abandoned by a romantic partner, the, the question to ask would be, what is this mirroring back to me? And the first idea that comes, of course, is, is that person engaged in some form of self-abandonment? That would be the primary thing to look at. I would imagine that in the vast majority of instances, the answer to that question would be yes. Once you see that you have this tendency to abandon yourself, then you can go about in a very conscious way, becoming your own best friend, your own guide, your own parent, your own teacher, your own cheerleader, your own supporter, your own best companion. And once you make that shift, then that will be mirrored back to you in the form of a partner who does not abandon you. And I want to end by uh, mentioning or asking, you, you write, human suffering is not random or arbitrary, but rich with meaning. I thought that was so beautiful. Yeah, that is my belief. And that's what all of my research shows. Uh, and that's one of the main reasons I do the work that I do. I think, you know, when something quote unquote bad happens, the suffering comes not so much from what has actually happened, but more so, in my opinion, from the appearance that it's random or meaningless or arbitrary. There's no suffering that is worse than suffering that appears to have no deeper meaning. But if the suffering has deeper meaning to you, that in and of itself lightens the suffering. And then if you can get really clear on what the deeper meaning is, then you can learn those lessons in a more conscious manner and then again, you don't need the suffering to prompt the learning. Thank you so much, Robert. I think this is so inspirational and really healing for people to learn about. And I got so inspired uh, of your previous books and also this book. Uh, you write so beautifully and uh, it's so relevant to oneself as well. So thank you for um, yeah, uh, following your some of your highest vibrational paths to do this. And, and uh, clearly you have found the courage in this life to do what you set out for. So thank you so much for that. Well, I, I want to say the same thing to you. I mean, thank you for this show that you're doing, which I think is a beautiful form of service to humanity. So thank you for following your people. Plan. And thank you for watching everybody. And I'll leave the link to the book below. May you shine the light that you are. Much love from the US and Norway. Bye bye.